Hello, this is the sixth video in our series in a whole Bible survey, going through the whole Bible. We've done uh, Exodus, we've done Leviticus, and now this uh, video is on Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then, our, then we're going to go back to Genesis. I think there are reasons, I think, I hope you'll see the method to the madness. For one is, I wanted to highlight that again, these are the scriptures of Israel. These are Jewish scriptures. And the story of Israel, as we see in Matthew's genealogy, Matthew's family tree, it really gets going with Abraham. There's a sense in which the book of Genesis is pre, the pre-story, but more on that in the next two videos. I wanna finish up Numbers and Deuteronomy today. Um, the first five books of the Old Testament are called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so we're covering the fourth and fifth book of this series of five books. In, in, in Hebrew, the Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew um, originally. Um, these are called the Torah, the, the Torah, uh, the law. Um, and so there are various names for these five books, the law, the Torah, uh, the Pentateuch, five scrolls. But they are, they are also sometimes called the law of Moses. Um, and the later parts of the Old Testament, I would say, uh, maybe even like in Ezra, uh, refers to it as the law of Moses, this, this group of five writings. I think when uh, the book of Psalms talks about the law of the Lord, it's probably talking about, again, the law of Moses, these, these books. So Numbers and Deuteronomy. Start with Numbers. Why not? Why is it called the book of Numbers? Uh, because of the census that takes place at the beginning of the book of Numbers. They take, they number the children of Israel. Uh, now, by the way, there'll be a census later on by David that he's not supposed to do. Second uh, Samuel uh, chapter 24, I think it is. It says that Satan actually, well, no, it doesn't. Uh, Chronicles tells us it, First Chronicles 21 tells us that Satan is behind that um, census. We'll talk about that. But the census that takes place in Numbers is a legitimate census. It's okay. Um, and so there is a numbering of Israel. There's also an assignment of Levites. So remember, there were 12 sons of Jacob. And uh, I believe it was the third son of Jacob is Levi. And from Levi will come the priests of Israel. So you can't just say, I want to be a priest when I grow up. You know, um, you, you had to be born into the right uh, genealogy into the right family in order to be a priest. And of course, Aaron and Moses were Levites. And so there's, there's the, uh, the sons of Aaron are like the, the cream of the crop or the, the, the high road within the Levites. But there are other priests as well who are not that high up on the food chain, but they're from other priestly families. Now, as we'll see in a few videos, when Israel takes the land of Canaan, um, 11 of the tribes, or, or let me put it this way, the Levites don't get a particular property. They don't get a particular region, but rather the Levites are to be spread throughout the land of Israel and to serve all of Israel as the priests of, Israel's, of Israel. So the Levites are assigned that portion, that job in the book of Numbers. There's also a group called the Nazarites, not to be confused with Nazarenes. Nazarenes are not Nazarites. Um, Nazarites were a kind of a, if you think of uh, monk, they were the monks of, the, uh, of, the, of Israel. Um, and the Nazarites uh, were not allowed to have alcohol, which of course we realize therefore that um, most Israelites did drink alcohol. Um, obviously it wasn't like our alcohol. Uh, but when you think of, of um, wine and things like that, these, these would have been um, standard drinks uh, within Israel. Again, they wouldn't have been as strong as wine today. Um, and there were also hygienic reasons uh, for, um, for people to be careful about what they drank. Uh, in, in some senses, there are places where wine is safer to drink than water because the, the alcohol kills off uh, various microorganisms you don't you don't want in your body. Um, so, um, but anyway, the Nazarites were a group of people who had a took a higher road. Uh, I don't know whether higher is the right word, but they they had a special place within Israel. Samson was a Nazarite. 
um, although he wasn't a good Nazarite. And we all know that one of the things that he was not, and you may not know, I can't assume that you know this, but Samson is in the book of Judges. Uh, he doesn't cut his hair. Um, he's a very strong man. And the book of Judges connects that strength to him not cutting his hair. And so the Nazarites did not drink and they did not um, cut their hair. That's part of, of their special thing that they bound themselves, much as a, a Roman Catholic priest is not supposed to ever marry. Uh, that's something that Roman Catholic priests do um, as being part of that special group of, of monks. Um, again, um, it's not the biblical, the Bible does not in any way require anybody not to marry. But um, so the Nazarites are, are mentioned in the book of Numbers. The first Passover, okay, so they, they come out of Egypt, they celebrate the Passover, uh, they leave Egypt. The first Passover after leaving Egypt is celebrated in the book of Numbers. And of course, the cloud and the fire uh, show them the way. Uh, that all takes place in chapter nine. Um, they get to the land of Canaan fairly quickly. Uh, this is, this is, um, is a, an interesting thing because of course, Israel will wander in the desert for 40 years. Uh, it's not that it takes 40 years to get from Egypt to, to Israel, um, but rather they, it, within a year, they've gotten there, right? This is a year later. They're celebrating the first Passover um, and they get to the brink of the land of Canaan. They come, they come in from the east. So they don't come in from the west side where Egypt's on the west side. This is this was a kind of a one of those, oh, okay, I get it. Um, but they came in from behind, I think I'm doing this right with the mirror, came in from behind the Jordan River from the east. Um, and uh, they sent spies in, they sent 12 spies uh, to look at the land. And 10 of, of the spies were, I uh, call them realists, or, or maybe call them as not having faith. But there were 10 spies who say, there's no way we can beat these people. They're giants. These people are huge. Even the grapes are huge. You know, we can't do it. Let's just stay in the desert. There's nothing wrong with the desert. I like, quite like the desert. But there are two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, who say, God can do this. We should do it, which is, which is a reminder that although probably most of the time um, it's good to be grounded and be a realist, but there is a time where God wants to do something extraordinary. Um, and in those days, um, you know, we looked, we looked to the, the people with the extraordinary faith um, uh, to, to lead the way. But in this case, the 10 people, uh, 10 spies prevail. And as a judgment on Israel for not having faith, they are pretty much consigned to 40 years of wandering in the desert. By the way, there are, I, I mentioned creeds. Um, it's not really a creed, and I've said th th that the Old Testament isn't really a creedal kind of book. It's more about action and, and story, especially. But here we have the second time we've seen this same statement. The Lord is slow to anger. Yahweh is slow to anger. He abounds in kessed. Uh, he forgives iniquity and transgression, but he doesn't clear the guilty. He visits the iniquity of the parents and the children to the third and fourth generation. So we saw this in Exodus 34. Um, it is the closest thing that the Old Testament has to a creed, I would say. Um, something that's repeated over and over throughout various strands of um, the Old Testament. I mentioned uh, Jonah 4.2, for example, where Jonah grumbling uh, quotes this. But again, God is a God of love. God is a God of forgiveness. Um, now, this to the third and fourth generation, hold on, we're going to talk about that when we get to Ezekiel 18 and Jeremiah 31, uh, where um, there is a kind of complaint, Lord, you're judging us for the sins of our parents. Um, you know, we, we're, we're repenting. Uh, uh, so we'll talk about that question of collective guilt versus individual guilt when we get to Jeremiah and Ezekiel a little bit later on. You may have heard this benediction. Um, I, I go to a Houghton Wesleyan Church here, and every once in a while, my pastor, Wes Oden, will end uh, the service with uh, this benediction. Uh, I even know a song. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Anyway. Um, but it's a great benediction, uh, and often pastors will, uh, a bless, a benediction is a blessing. So there's a, there's what's called a closing prayer. That's where we all close our eyes 
and and somebody maybe the pastor says lord i pray for everybody this week and, and so forth um and i do i pray for you all may you all have a great day in the lord um those of you who are watching this video whenever day you're watching it um but a benediction is different a benediction is a blessing uh and you you tend to keep your eyes open when you bless them, and you say the lord bless you the lord keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you um, or may the, uh, uh, the, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Those are benedictions, they're blessings. And so we have the priestly benediction here in Numbers 6, uh, verses 24 uh, through 26. Uh, again, I've, I've mentioned, I mentioned this in my video, previous video on Leviticus, uh, that the focus on uh, atonement, atonement is getting right with God by way of a sacrifice. Um, the, the focus on atonement in the Old Testament is not on intentional sin. It's on unintentional sin. Now, we'll have, we'll have a reason when we get to the New Testament to talk a little bit more about what, what is this? What is sin for us? How should we as Christians understand sin? Uh, but the Old Testament is, is very much focused on um, unintentional sin. Um, there's a sense in which intentional sin, well, you're just, you're gone, you know, out of here, dunk tank. <laughs> um, so we'll do, I'll talk about that in a second when I talk about the um, uh, the cities of refuge. I'll talk about about that. Hold that thought. Um, but again, I want to point out that sins with a high hand in the Old Testament, there's not much room for forgiveness for those. It's more like dunk tank. Uh, you're out of here. Um, Numbers has this curious story of uh, a prophet for hire named Balaam and this donkey that talks. So I, I always found this story puzzling because I thought, well, how can somebody, how could God use this prophet who is not believing in Israel? It was, this just does not compute. I know it's such a hard time understanding this. Um, I suppose there's a principle here that God can use people who don't um, fully understand God who don't, who aren't fully cooked in their spiritual understanding. Um, maybe even people who have a mostly wrong spiritual understanding. God can can use can use them. So Balaam is a kind of prophet for hire. It's like give me some money and I'll prophesy. I'll preach. And this also gives us into the ancient Near Eastern worldview. The ancient uh, Near East basically said, yeah, yeah, there are lots of gods out there. And Balaam's like, tell me which God you want me to use. Uh, and it's like, it's like Balaam has a, a key ring with the name of, of a bunch of different gods on it. It's like, oh, so you're a, you're a Marduk person? Oh, I've got this key. Let me see if I can get Marduk to do something for you. Oh, okay, so you're a, um, a Dagon guy? Okay, I'll, I'll use this key to create a Dagon. Um, Balaam is kind of like a uh, any god goes kind of uh, prophet for hire. And um, this guy named Balak, who is an enemy of Israel, hires uh, Balaam, you know, to basically go to Yahweh against Israel, turn, turn, you know, turn God back on them. It doesn't work, of course. Um, every time Balaam goes to Yahweh to try to get him to turn on Israel, instead, Balaam says, nope, God's going to bless Israel, which makes Balak very upset. I didn't, you know, Balak's like, I didn't pay you money so that you could bless my enemy. I paid you money so that you could get the enemy's God to come to my side. Um, but the famous story where, where uh, Balaam uh, is going to prop prophesy against Israel and uh, his donkey sees this angel in the way, Balaam can't see it. And the donkey refuses to go. And Balaam starts beating the donkey, you know, and um, finally the donkey talks and says, there's an angel up there. I'm saving your life, man. Uh, because if I, you know, because if you'd gone forward, the angel would have killed you. Um, and, and so, uh, I suppose there's a, a reminder here that, that sometimes we don't have the whole picture. Sometimes we're angry at the wrong person. Sometimes in fact, um, there's something going on and, and we just, we don't understand. Um, and our natural reaction is to jump to a conclusion that isn't true. I think there's a, there's a, a lesson there for us to be reminded of from, from time to time. They have battles with a couple Kings, Sihon, Og, they win, uh, they beat both of them. Um, Midian. Okay, cities of refuge. The cities of refuge are places where if you unintentionally kill somebody, let's say I'm cleaning my roof, as I do all the time, 
and I knock one of the stones off of my roof and somebody happens to be walking by and oops, they're dead. Um, now, in, in our way of viewing things, and, and this is actually, think ba- I think, based on the New Testament. I think the New Testament leads us to see intentionality as the cornerstone of, of, of ethical expectation. That we, I think, I think very rightly, the Bible, the New Testament has led us in, uh, I think, especially Western culture, to take a person's intention into account. We have this in our legal system. There is first degree murder, second degree murder. There's in, involuntary manslaughter. There's rec, you know, negligence, uh, negligent homo, homicide. So there's all these different levels and the punishment fits the, the level of intentionality, right? So a, a first degree murder is premeditated and planned. A second degree murder is a little bit more kind of spur of the moment murder, um, which thankfully I've not done any of these things. So you can, you're safe. Um, but the Old Testament, I, I don't want to say that it's not, well, I do in a way. I want to say that in the, in, the, in the journey of progressive understanding, in the journey of progressive revelation, the, the Old Testament in the ancient Near East still focuses very much on a kind of automatic penalty um, to some degree. Um, I, I mean, that's not true. That's not entirely true. There are, there are levels of punishment in the Old Testament, right? Intentionality is, is, is complete, is stoned to death. Uh, whereas there is some mercy for unintentional um, sin. So I'm back a little bit off of what I said, not entirely. But so, for example, if you unintentionally kill somebody, uh, there is a city of refuge where you can go until the year of Jubilee. And, they're not, and you're, somebody is not allowed to come and, and give an eye for an eye uh, when it comes to that. Now, if you intentionally murder someone, the city of refuge is not going to save you. If you intentionally murder someone, the family can come into the city of refuge, drag you off, and and uh, and see justice done. But th- it, this is interesting, though, to me, because there are places, there are cu- cultures in the world where unintentional uh, killing. Let's say I run over someone with my car, but let's say they ran out in front of my car, and I, there's nothing I could do. They ran out in front of my car, and I ran them over. I mean, uh, missionaries have experienced this sort of things uh, from time to time. Um, and in that culture, it can be considered uh, completely appropriate for the family of the person you killed to hunt you down, um, from what I understand. Um, and so uh, that's a little bit like the Old Testament, uh, except that these cities of refuge pr- provided a, a safe house, as it were, a safe city uh, for someone to go if they accidentally uh, killed someone. Fascinating. Again, a reminder that the worldview of the Old Testament is a a, a God meeting the ancient Near East where it was and moving it from uh, from there. Um, we'll see what, whether you agree with me um, when we have our uh, talkback session um, or in comments that you make on YouTube. So Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. In the setting of uh, Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy is basically, let's review what we've learned here, kind of getting ready for the test. You're about to enter the land of Canaan. What do you do? Um, well, you go back over the law, right? You review. Uh, and so think of Deuteronomy as review for the test or a second law. So the first law is at Mount Sinai, right? That's where the first giving of the law is. And now 40 years later, about to enter the land of Canaan, we have the second law, the book of Deuteronomy. Um, I would not be alone in thinking that when the book of Joshua refers to the book of the law, and when the, when the book of Second Kings refers to the book of the law, that probably that's referring to Deuteronomy. I'm sure not everybody agrees with that, but there's, there's something, if you, if you go from the end of Deuteronomy to the beginning of Joshua, there's a real continuity uh, between the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Joshua. It's like they go together in a way that Exodus and Joshua don't, don't fit together. So it seems to me that there is, there is good reason to think uh, that the book of the law refers to uh, the book of Deuteronomy. The, the, the other thing is that Deuteronomy itself calls itself a book of the law. I'm looking here at Deuteronomy 31, uh, 26, and so forth. So uh, later on, when, when um, under the reign of Josiah, they find the book of the law in the temple, I think what they find is more or less the book of, of Deuteronomy. Again, these are debated things, and I hope hope not to die for uh, venturing a uh, my my sense of things, uh, but 
So Deuteronomy is uh, the book of the law, I would say. We get the Ten Commandments again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Most importantly for Jewish religion, the cornerstone of Jewish religion is, as I mentioned in my video on the Ten Commandments, what's called the Shema. And Shema is the first word of Deuteronomy 6.4. Shema, O Israel, Adonai uh, Elohim, Adonai Echad. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Sometimes it's translated, the Lord is our God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, but I, I think probably in, in the context of, of where Israel is at at the time, uh, that probably it would make more sense to translate it, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Um, and it kind of, again, that henotheistic uh, context. But this is the cornerstone of Israelite uh, faith, that Yahweh is their God. Not, no other God is their God. Um, Baal is not their God. Um, they, they are, uh, the ancients would have considered them perverse. The, the ancients didn't have trouble with your God. Um, they just wanted you to worship their God too. Um, remember in Jonah, when the sailors, the sailors are trying to figure out, ah, some God's upset with us. You know, we're having a storm because some God's upset with us. And they're like, everybody pray to your God. You pray to your God and I'll pray to my God. And by the, between all of us, we'll get the right God and we'll stop this storm. Um, but that's not the way Israelite, Israel faith, Israelite faith didn't look at it that way. Israelite faith did not think, well, it's okay to worship Baal and Ashtoreth and Yahweh. Um, they believed that Yahweh was the only God that they should worship and that they should not worship Baal. Um, and so Yahweh is our God, not these other gods. And so that monotheistic or at this time, henotheistic, perhaps, understanding of faith was not only unique uh, in the ancient world. We saw in, in the previous video that Akhenaten in Egypt for a very short period believed in one God also, and they killed him. Um, and that was done. They buried him and nobody knew about him until recent history. Um, so this was considered to be perverse. The Jews, the Romans would later consider the Jews to be atheists almost. You know, what's wrong with you? Why don't you believe in the gods? Uh, it was just strange to think of a Christian as being thought of as an atheist because they only worship one God. Um, but, but again, this is, the, this is the heart of Israelite faith. There, we have one God, and it's Yahweh. And that is the highest God, El Elyon. The greatest commandment. You didn't know Deuteronomy had such central uh, teachings in it. Deuteronomy 6, 5, you will love the Lord your God, follows right on it. Yeah, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore, you will love the Lord your God. You will, you will love Yahweh Elohim. Elohim is another word for, uh, Elohim is the generic word for God, as we'll see in our next videos, um, whereas Yahweh is the personal name of God. I'm Ken, God is Yahweh. Um, so person, Elohim. Elohim is the category, God. More on that to come. You will love Yahweh Elohim, uh, Eloheinu actually is the, the Hebrew here, our God, um, or Eloheka, so Eloheka, your God. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Jesus will say that this is the great commandment, uh, and love your neighbors yourself. Um, so here is another, another verse. Um, sometimes these days we get into fights over, over the phrase uh, social justice. Um, some people would say social justice is a secular concept. I, I, I don't care what you call it, but the, uh, sometimes I call it biblical justice just to short circuit that whole uh, argument. Uh, but I read an article once by a, a scholar. He's now, he's now passed, but his name was uh, Terence uh, Fredheim. And he basically argued that this idea of uh, executing justice for the orphan and the widow providing, uh, loving the stranger in the land, providing those who need food and clothing, that this, these ideas are not, they're not liberal ideas. Uh, they're, not, they're not even um, new ideas in ancient Israel. Uh, when the prophets, the, pro the prophets, when they talk about taking care of the widow and the orphan, they're just going back to what Deuteronomy says. Um, and so Fred Heim's article is basically that that this social justice is a is a conservative value in the in the Old Testament. Again, whatever you want to think of that language, 
um, the Lord, uh, Yahweh Eloheka, Yahweh your God, is uh, God of gods uh, and Lord of lords. He is the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial. He takes no bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and for the widow. He loves the stranger. He provides them with food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers uh, in the land of Egypt. This is core Israelite faith. Um, Israel remembers that they were slaves in Egypt, um, and therefore, um, and that they were foreigners in Egypt, and that they were strangers in the land of Egypt, and that they were oppressed or uh, certainly more than disadvantaged in Egypt because they, they didn't belong there. And so this idea of being kind to the foreigner, being kind to the immigrant, uh, being kind, uh, helping those who are knocked off track, who are poor and so forth. This is not a liberal value. This is a core uh, Old Testament value um, as we see here in, in the book of Deuteronomy. And it comes out of that sense that Israel, the Israelites were slaves once. And these passages resonated very strong um, with um, uh, American slaves uh, and especially after they were they were given their freedom after the Civil War, resonated very strongly with these Exodus texts and and so forth. Um, this is biblical. It's in the Old Testament. Um, chapter eighteen talks about a prophet like Moses. Now we know that the greatest prophet like Moses, the New Testament tells us this, the greatest prophet like Moses is Jesus, of course. Now it had to have a meeting for them too. Some have suggested that since Deuteronomy was found, in the temple under the reign of Josiah. Some have suggested that perhaps uh, at that time they would have thought of Josiah as a prophet like Moses. And of course it can be both and, but Jesus is clearly the greatest prophet um, like Moses. Moses 2.0 uh, or Moses infinity 0, um, as we will find when we get to the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew portrays Jesus as a new Moses, the best Moses yet. Um, Again, going, going back to this question of how do we decide, we know that Deuteronomy was written for ancient Israel, right? We know Deuteronomy was for Israel. Here, O Israel, it's addressed to Israel. The law is addressed to Israel. And so we know that the commands of the Bible are for that time or were for that time. The question then becomes, how do we negotiate the distance between that time and our time? How do we know what applied just to them in terms of its specifics? Now, we can find principles. Sure, we can find universal timeless principles, yes. But how do we know what specific instruction was for that time and what was for all time? Maybe some of it was for one time, like when Jesus says, go, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Was that, that wasn't even for that time. It was for one guy. Um, and so there are, I think we would all agree, some that time commands uh, in Deuteronomy. Like there are laws in Deuteronomy about somebody who has more than one wife. Uh, I think it's Deuteronomy 24. If a man has more than one wife and he likes one more than the other, uh, but the firstborn son is from this, the wife he doesn't like, he can't show more favoritism to the son of the wife he doesn't like uh, or to the wife uh, he does like. Uh, he has to show favoritism to the firstborn son of the wife he doesn't like. I mean, you know, these are uh, ancient Israel issues, um, not our issues, because I, I would say that um, as Christians, we believe uh, that uh, marriage is ideally between one husband and one uh, wife, but you'll go, you're, you're going to have a hard time finding one husband, one wife in the Bible. Uh, the, I mean, that's not really spelled out anywhere. Um, it's it's a somewhat assumed uh, in some places, but not really in the Old Testament. And I think you have to you have to remember that we read a lot of things in into scripture, like where it says uh, a man will leave his father and wife and they will become one flesh. Um, uh, who's to say that a, a person can't become one flesh with more than one wife? Uh, in fact, surely um, David would have seen himself as being one flesh with all of his wives. You see what I'm saying? We have these oh uh, paradigm shift where we we don't even realize we're wearing glasses when we read various various passages. And so I believe that the tra trajectory of scripture uh, is moving toward one husband, one wife. I do think that's the trajectory of scripture. Uh, but the Old Testament law does not at all assume 
that it has to be one husband, one wife. That's just certainly not the assumption of Deuteronomy. Um, and then we have the, the law of leveret marriage, which is very interesting um, that if, um, if a, a, a brother marries and he dies without having offspring, then the next brother needs to raise up seed for his dead brother uh, by sleeping or taking on as an extra wife, perhaps. I mean, he may be married already anyway, right? Um, it's not just talking about an unmarried man marrying the wife of his older brother. It's about raising up offspring to the older brother. This is about keeping property. Uh, these rules of property are meant so that we don't get into fights and feuds and, and things like that. And so um, the, the, the wife, until, until the older brother has an offspring, we've got a problem, Houston. Um, and so it's, it's about, it's not even about taking care of the wife. Uh, it's about making sure that the firstborn son, who's now dead, has an heir so that the property is, 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 is stewarded properly. Um, and so there's this idea of, of younger uh, rel or relatives. Uh, we find this in the book of Ruth as, as well. A, a relative raising up offspring uh, for, and it's not considered their offering, offspring, I don't think. So like the second son doesn't get to count the, the son that they have with the, their older brother's wife as their son. It's the son of their older brother who's dead now. Again, different world. This is a different world than our world. Uh, it's the ancient Near East, which is a crazy place, a rough place uh, compared to, to our world. By the way, in the New Testament, in Mark 12, where the Sadducees come to Jesus and say, there were seven brothers and they passed the wife down and there's never an offspring. Whose wife is she going to be in heaven? Um, they're trying to catch Jesus out. And of course, Jesus basically says, you know, there's no giving in marriage in heaven. Women are free agents in heaven. Uh, they're not tied to a man. They're not bound to a man in heaven. Um, but anyway, that, that, whole, that whole story or scenario that the Sadducees throw out is based upon this levered marriage idea. Um, Deuteronomy um, ends with blessing and curses or close to the end. Um, and this is a fundamental, it, sometimes it's called deuteronomistic theology. And deuteronomistic theology is, uh, it's right, but it's not complete. Um, the, the part of Deuteron deuteronomistic theology that's not complete is, is that sometimes we get our blessing or our judgment after death. And Deuteronomy doesn't seem to know anything about that. Deuteronomy is a very this worldly blessing and cursing. If you keep God's commandments, you'll be blessed in the land and you'll be blessed in your crops and you're blessed when you go out, you're blessed when you come in, blessed, 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 blessed. But if you don't serve Yahweh and keep his commands, you'll be cursed in the land and you'll be cursed when you go out and you'll be cursed when you come in and, and you're cursed in the land and, and curse, 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 curse. And so um, the, the blessing and cursing of Deuteronomy is a this worldly blessing and cursing. We know, because we have the rest of the Bible, this idea of progressive understanding, progressive revelation, we know that sometimes the righteous suffer in this world, see the book of Job, and sometimes the wicked prosper in this world, see the book of Second Kings. And so Deuteronomistic theology, that if you serve God, you're blessed, if you don't serve God, you're judged, that's true, but it needs, it needs a little bit of, of fleshing out, because after all, uh, Jesus was the most righteous person ever, and yet he suffered unjustly on the cross. So it, it's not the case that you will always be blessed in this life if you serve God, or that you'll always be judged in this life if you don't serve God. It's not that simple. And so Deuteronomy kind of gives us the, the kindergarten version, and we need the rest of the Bible uh, to fill out the details of, well, there's some exceptions to this, this sort of rule. But um, this theology in Deuteronomy 28 and 29 um, is the bedrock for understanding the book of Joshua, for understanding Judges, for understanding Samuel and Kings, the way that its thinking works with regard to uh, prosperity and, and so forth. And you'll find that sometimes those who preach a prosperity gospel, they, they, they only give part of the story. They only give the Deuteronomistic part of the story. They don't get to the, well, sometimes the righteous suffer, um, that, which is an important piece to that. Uh, puzzle as well. But we'll, we'll return to this idea of Deuteronomistic thinking um, when we go into Joshua and Judges and, and so forth. Um, Moses, of course, dies at the end of Deuteronomy, which raises the question of how could Moses have written 
Deuteronomy. Well, of course, God could have told Moses and Moses written it down and Moses thinking, oh, this is about to happen. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, uh, of course, Deuteronomy always refers to Moses in the third person. Moses did that. Moses did this. Moses went up into a mountain and died. And so I would say that from an inductive, from an inductive standpoint, inductive is where you look at the evidence and you draw the most likely conclusion. We would not inductively conclude that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. The issue, uh, as we've talked about in our live session, uh, is that the New Testament refers to Moses, seems to think of Moses as the author of, of the Pentateuch. Now, a lot of times when the New Testament says Moses says, it's quoting things Moses says. So uh, that's different from saying that Moses is the author. Um, it, it could simply be saying Moses says it, and of course, Moses says it. Uh, in the Pentateuch. But there are places, there are, it's few, I think, relatively, but there are a few places in the New Testament where Moses is assumed to be the actual author of these books, not just the person being quoted um, in these books. So that's something that we may want to process as we continue our journey uh, through the Bible. Well, this has been a video on Numbers and Deuteronomy, um, the um, sixth video in our series uh, as we go through the entire Bible and hopefully we are growing in our, our sense of what the questions are and, and in our sophistication with regard to hermeneutics. We're on a journey. We'll see where we all end up.